Good evening. Coach Stock here once again, continuing our readings on the Ladder of Divine Ascent by St. John Climacus. Step 7. On Joy-Making Mourning. Mourning, according to God, is sadness of soul in the disposition of a sorrowing heart, which ever madly seeks that for which it thirsts, and when it fails in its quest, it painfully pursues it and follows it in its wake grievously lamenting or thus mourning is a golden spur in a soul which is stripped of all attachment and of all ties fixed by holy sorrow to watch over the heart compunction is a perennial trial of the conscience which brings about the cooling of the fire of the heart through mental confession and confession is a forgetfulness of nature since someone because of this forgot to eat his bread Repentance is the cheerful deprival of every bodily comfort. A characteristic of those who are still progressing in blessed mourning is temperance and silence of the lips, and of those who have made progress, freedom from anger and patient endurance of injuries, and of the perfect humility, thirst for dishonors, voluntary craving for involuntary afflictions, non-condemnation of sinners, compassion even beyond one's strength. The first are acceptable, the second laudable, but blessed are those who hunger for hardship and thirst for dishonor, for they shall be filled with the food whereof there can be no satiety. If you possess the gift of mourning, hold on to it with all your might, for it is easily lost when it is not firmly established. And just as wax melts in the presence of fire, so it is easily dissolved by noise and bodily cares and by luxury, and especially by talkativeness and levity. Greater than baptism itself is the fountain of tears after baptism, even though it is somewhat audacious to say so. For baptism is the washing away of evils that were in us before, but sins committed after baptism are washed away by tears. As baptism is received in infancy, we have all defiled it, but we cleanse it anew with tears. And if God in his love for mankind had not given us tears, those being saved would be few indeed and hard to find. Groanings and sorrow cry to the Lord. Tears shed from fear intercede for us, but tears of all holy love show us that our prayer has been accepted. If nothing goes so well with humility as mourning, certainly nothing is so opposed to it as laughter. Keep a firm hold of the blessed gladdening sorrow of holy compunction, and do not stop working at it until it raises you high above the things of this world and presents you pure to Christ. Do not cease to picture and scrutinize the dark abyss of eternal fire and merciless servants, the uncompassionate and inexorable judge, the bottomless pit of subterranean flame, the ner- narrow descents to the awful underground, chambers and yawning gulfs, and of all such things, so that the sensuality in our soul may be checked by great terror and give place to incorruptible chastity, and itself receive the shining of the immaterial light which radiates more than any fire. During prayer and supplication, stand with trembling like a convict standing before a judge, so that both by your outward appearance as well as by your inner disposition, you may extinguish the wrath of the just judge. For he will not despise a widow's soul standing before him burdened with sorrow and wearying the unwearying one. He who has obtained heartfelt prayer, tear, he who has obtained heartfelt tears will find any place convenient for mourning but he whose weeping is only outward show will spend endless time discussing places and manners hidden treasure is safer from robbery than that exposed in the market let us apply this to what we have just said do not be like those who in burying their dead first lament over them and then get drunk for their sake but be like the prisoners in the mines who are flogged every hour by the jailers He who sometimes mourns and sometimes indulges in luxury and laughter is like one who stones the dog of sensuality with bread. In appearance, he is driving it away, but in fact, he is encouraging it to be constantly with him. Be concentrated without self-display, withdrawn into your heart, for the demons fear concentration as thieves fear dogs. It is not to a wedding banquet that we have been called here, certainly not. But he who has called us has called us here to mourn for ourselves. When they weep, 
Some force themselves unseasonably to think of nothing at all during this blessed time, not realizing that tears without thought are proper only to an irrational nature and not to a rational one. Tears are the product of thought, and the father of thought is a rational mind. Let your reclining in bed be for you an image of your declining into your grave, and you will sleep less. Let your refreshment at the table be for you a reminder of the grim table of those worms, and you will be less indulgent. And in drinking water, do not forget the thirst in that flame, and you will certainly do violence to your nature. When we suffer from superior honorable dishonor, scolding or punishment, let us remember the fearful sentence of the judge, and we shall kill with meekness and patience, as with a two-edged sword, the irrational sorrow and bitterness which will certainly be sown in us. To see waste with time, as Job says, and with time and patience the things which we have spoken are gradually acquired and perfected in us. Let the remembrance of the eternal fire lie down with you every evening, and let it rise with you too. Then sloth will never overwhelm you at the time of psalmody. Let your very dress urge you to the work of mourning, because all who lament the dead are dressed in black. If you do not mourn, mourn for this cause, and if you mourn, lament still the more. By your sins you have brought yourself down from a state free of labors to one of labor. In the case of tears, as in everything else, our good and just judge will certainly take into consideration the strength of our nature. For I have seen small tear drops shed with difficulty like drops of blood, and I have also seen fountains of tears poured out with difficulty. And I judge those toilers more by their toil than by their tears, and I think that God does also. Theology will not suit mourners, for it is of a nature to dissolve their mourning. For the theologian is like one who sits in a teacher's seat, whereas the mourner is like one who spends his days on a dung heap and in rags. That is why David, so I think, although he was a teacher and was wise, replied to those who questioned him when he was mourning, How shall I sing the Lord's song in a strange land? That is to say, the land of passions. Both in creation and in compunction, there is that which moves itself and that which is moved by something else. When the soul becomes tearful, moist and tender without effort or trouble, then let us run, for the Lord has come uninvited and is giving us the sponge of God-loving sorrow and the cool water of devout tears to wipe out the record of our sins. Guard these tears as the apple of your eye until they withdraw. Great is the power of this compunction, greater than that which comes as a result of our own effort and reflection. He who mourns when he wishes has not attained the beauty of mourning, but rather he who mourns on the subjects of his choice, and not even on these, but on what God wants. The ugly tears of vainglory are often interwoven with mourning which is pleasing to God. We shall know this with all proof and piety when we see ourselves mourning and still doing evil. Genuine compunction is undistracted pain of sorrow. Genuine compunction is undistracted pain of soul, in which it gives itself no relief, but hourly imagines only its disillusion. And it awaits like cool water the comfort of God who comforts humble monks. Those who have obtained mourning in the depth of their being hate their own life as something painful and wearisome, and a cause of tears and sufferings, and they turn and flee from their body as from an enemy. When we see anger and pride in those who seem to be mourning in a way pleasing to God, then their tears are to be regarded as repugnant to God. For what communion hath light with darkness? The fruit of spurious compunction is self-esteem, and the fruit of praiseworthy compunction is consolation. Just as fire is destructive of straw, so are pure tears destructive of all material and spiritual impurity. Many of the fathers say that the question of tears, especially in the case of beginners, is an obscure matter and hard to ascertain, as tears are born in many different ways. For instance, there are tears from nature, from God, from adverse suffering, from praiseworthy suffering, from vainglory, from licentiousness, from love, from the remembrance of death, and from many other causes. Stripped by the fear of God, let us train ourselves in all these ways and acquire for ourselves pure and guileless tears over our disillusion. For there is no dissimulation or self-esteem in them, but on the contrary there is purification, progress in love for God, washing away of sin in this fashion. It is not surprising if mourning begins with good tears and ends with bad, but it is praiseworthy if 
if reprehensible, and natural tears are goaded on to spiritual tears. People inclined to vainglory understand this problem clearly. Do not trust your fountains of tears before your soul has been perfectly purified, for wine cannot be trusted when it is drawn straight from the vats. No one will dispute that all our tears, according to God, are profitable, but we shall only know at the time of our death what the profit is. He who wends his way in constant mourning, according to God, does not cease to feast daily, but eternal weeping awaits him who does not cease to feast bodily. Convicts in prison have no joy or delight, and true monks have no feast on earth. Perhaps that is why the excellent mourner, sighing, said, Bring my soul out of prison, that it may rejoice henceforward in thine ineffable light. Be like a king in your heart, seated high in humility and commanding laughter. Go, and it goes, and sweet weeping. Come, and it comes, and our tyrant and slave, the body. Do this, and it does it. He who is clothed in blessed and grace-filled mourning, as in a wedding garment, knows the spiritual laughter of the soul. Can anyone be found who has spent all his days in a monastic life so piously that he has never lost a day or hour or moment, but has spent all his time for the Lord, bearing in mind that never in your life can you see the same day twice? Blessed is the monk who can lift up the eyes of his soul to the spiritual host, but he is truly saved from falling, who from the remembrance of sin and death constantly moistens his cheeks with living waters from his bodily eyes. And it is not hard for me to believe that the second condition leads on to the first. I have seen shameless petitioners and beggars with clever words soon incline even the hearts of kings to compassion. And I have seen men poor and needy in virtue with words not clever, but rather humble, vague and stumbling, call shamelessly and persistently from the depths of a desperate heart upon the heavenly king, and by their violence force his inviolable nature and compassion. He who in his heart is proud of his tears and secretly condemns those who do not weep is like a man who asks the king for a weapon against his enemy and then commits suicide with it. My friends, God does not ask or desire that man should mourn from sorrow of heart, but rather that out of love for him, he should rejoice with spiritual laughter. Remove the sin and the tear of sorrow is superfluous for your eyes. What is the use of a bandage when there is no wound? Before his transgression, Adam had no tears, just as there will be none after the resurrection, when sin, sin will be abolished, for pain, sorrow, and sighing will then have fled away. In some I have seen mourning, and in others I have seen mourning for lack of mourning, though having it they are as if they were without it. And through this splendid ignorance they remi remain inviolate. And of them it is said, The Lord maketh wise the blind. Tears often lead frivolous people to pride, and that is why they are not given to some. And such people, seeking tears in vain, consider themselves unfortunate and condemn themselves to sighing, lamentation, sorrow of soul, deep grief, and utter dismay, all of which, though profitably regarded by them as nothing, can safely take the place of tears. If we watch carefully, we shall often find a bitter joke played on us by the demons. For when we are full, they stir us up to compunction, and when we are fasting, they harden our hearts so that, being deceived by spurious tears, we may give ourselves up to indulgence, which is the mother of passions. We must not listen to them, but rather do the opposite. When I consider the actual nature of compunction, I am amazed at how... That which is called mourning and grief should contain joy and gladness interwoven within it. Like honey in the comb, what then are we to learn from this? That such compunction is, in a special sense, a gift of the Lord? There is, then, in the soul no pleasureless pleasure, for God consoles those who are contrite in heart in a secret way. But as an inducement to most splendid mourning and profitable sorrow, let us hear a soul-profiting and most pitiful story. There lived here a certain Stephen, who had embraced an eremitic and solitary life, and had spent many years in monastic training. His soul was especially adorned with tears and fasting, and was bedecked with many other good achievements. He had a cell on the slope of this holy mountain, where the holy prophet and seer of God, Elias, once lived. But later, this renowned man resolved upon a more effective, austere, and stricter repentance. 
and went to a place of hermits called Sidim. There he spent several years in a life of great austerity. This place was bereft of every comfort and was almost untrodden by the foot of man, being about 70 miles from the fort. Towards the end of his life, the elder returned to his cell on the holy mountain, where he had two extremely pious disciples from Palestine who took care of the elder's cell. Having passed a few days there, he fell into the illness from which he reposed. On the day before his death, he went into an ec ecstasy of mind, and with open eyes he looked to the right and left of his bed, as if he were being called to account by someone. In the hearing of all the bystanders, he said, Yes, indeed, that is true. But that is why I fasted for so many years. And then again, yes, it is quite true, but I wept and served the brethren. And again, no, you are slandering me. And sometimes he would say, yes, it is true. Yes, I do not know what to say to this, but in God there is mercy. And it was truly an awful and horrible sight, this invisible and merciless inquisition. And what was most terrible, he was accused of what he had not done. How amazing! Of several of his sins, the Hezekast and Hermit said, I do not what, know what to say to this, although he, had, although he had been a monk for nearly forty years and had the gift of tears. Alas, alas, where then was the voice of Ezekiel to say to the demons, As I find you, I will judge you, saith God. Truly he could make no such defense. Why? Glory be to him who alone knows. And some, as before the Lord, told me that he even fed a leopard from his hand in the desert and while being thus called to account he was parted from his body leaving us in uncertainty as to his judgment or end or sentence or how the trial ended just as a widow bereft of her husband and having an only son finds in him her sole comfort after the lord so for a soul that has fallen there is no other consolation at the time of its departure but the toils of fasting and tears such ones never sing, nor do they loudly cry out to themselves in hymns, because such things dis dissipate mourning. And if you hope to summon it by such means, then you are a long way from achieving your aim. For mourning is the conditioned pain of a soul on fire. In many people, mourning has been the precursor of blessed dispassion, and it prepared, plowed, and discarded sinful matter. One skilled practicer of this virtue told me, frequently, as soon as I tried to surrender myself to vanity or anger or overeating, the thought of mourning protested within me and said, Do not be vain or I shall leave you. And so too, at the urging of other passions, I would say to the thought, I shall never disobey you until you present me to Christ. The abyss of mourning has seen comfort, and purity of heart has received illumination. Illumination is an ineffable activity which is unknowingly perceived and invisibly seen. Comfort is the solace of souring soul, which, like a child, at once both whimpers to itself and shouts happily. Divine succor is the renewal of a soul depressed by grief, which, in a wonderful way, transforms painful tears into painless ones. Tears over our departure produce fear, but when fear gives birth to fearlessness, joy dawns. But when constant joy is obtained, holy love bursts into a flower. Drive away with the hand of humility every transitory joy as being unworthy of it, lest by readily admitting it, you receive a wolf instead of a shepherd. Do not hasten to divine vision when it is not time for divine vision, that it may pursue and embrace the beauty of your humility and unite with you forever in immaculate marriage. As soon as a baby begins to recognize its father, it is all filled with joy. But if the father goes away for a time on business and then comes home again, the child becomes full of joy and sorrow, joy at seeing the beloved and at sorrow at being deprived for so long of that fair beauty. And a mother sometimes hides herself from her child, and when she sees with what sorrow it seeks her, she is delighted, for thus she teaches it to be attached to her forever and fans the flame of its love for her. He that hath ears to ear, let him hear, saith the Lord. A condemned man who has heard the death sentence will not worry about how theaters are managed. So too, he who is truly lamenting will never return to luxury or glory or anger or irritability. Mourning is the conditioned sorrow of a repentant soul who adds sorrow to sorrow, as a woman suffers when she bears a child. Righteous and holy is the Lord, 
who by his good word pricks with compunction the man who dwells in stillness intelligently, and he daily gladdens the man who is obedient intelligently. But he who does not rightly practice one of these two ways is deprived of mourning. Drive away the hellhound that comes at the time of your deepest mourning and suggest that God is not merciful or compassionate. For if you watch it, you will find that before the sin, he calls God loving, compassionate, and forgiving. Practice gives birth to perseverance, and perseverance culminates, cultivates in understanding, culminate, culminates in understanding. But that which is accomplished with understanding is not easily eradicated. However great the life we lead may be, we may count it stale and spurious if we have not acquired a contrite heart. For that is essential, truly essential, if I may say so, that those who have again been defiled after baptism should cleanse the pitch from their hands with unceasing fire of the heart and with the oil of God. I have seen some who have attained to the last degree of mourning, for I saw them literally pouring out their mouths the blood of a suffering and wounded heart, and I remembered him who said, I am smitten like grass, and withered is my heart. Tears caused by fear bring protection with them. But tears produced by love, which has not attained perfection, as may happen in the case of some, are easily stolen away. Unless perhaps the memory of the eternal fire, when active, should kindle the heart. And it is surprising how much safer is the humbler way in its season. There are material substances which dry the fountains of our tears, and there are others which produce mud and reptiles in them. From the former, Lot had illicit intercourse with his daughters, and from the latter, the devil fell from heaven. Our enemies are so wicked that they turn even the mothers of virtues into mothers of vices, and those things which make for humility, they make into a cause for pride. Frequently, the very setting and sight of our solitary dwellings are of a nature to rouse our mind to compunction. Let Jesus of Navi, Elias, and John, who prayed alone, convince you of this. I have often, often seen tears provoked in cities and crowds to make us think that the crowds do us no harm, and so to draw us nearer to the world, for this is the aim of the evil spirits. One word has often dispelled mourning, but it would be a wonder indeed if one word brought it back. When our soul leaves this world, we shall not be blamed for not having worked miracles or for not having been theologians, or not having been wrapped in divine visions, we shall certainly have to give an account to God of why we have not unceasingly mourned. This is the seventh step. May he who has found worthy of it help me too, for he himself has already been helped since through the seventh step he has washed away the stains of this world. And then there's an the icon of the cave at Thola where St. John struggled for 40 years. And the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen.